Screenwriter Ed Solomon on developing the unique drama series for HBO Mosaic, which you can watch both on the Mosaic app and on HBO every Monday night at 8 p.m. as part of the six-part series going into the murder of Olivia Lake, who committed the crime, and the various perspectives of the suspects, which you can see through the app and in a unique way on the television show, which Ed goes into on our podcast. We'll learn all about his collaboration with Mosaic's director Steven Soderbergh, and we'll also look back on his career collaborating with Gary Shandling on It's Gary Shandling Show, the screenplay for Men in Black, Ed's process for developing the distinct voice of each character and actor that he writes for, and how the branching, multiple-perspective writing process for Mosaic has influenced Ed's future projects and how he looks at screenwriting. For more information on the Road to Cinema podcast, please visit jogroadproductions.com. You can follow us on Twitter, at jogroad, Instagram at Jog Road Productions. You can like our Jog Road Productions Facebook page. You can subscribe to Jog Road Productions on YouTube to watch our Road to Cinema video interviews with Don Cheadle, Greta Gerwig, and Hewitt McGregor, among many others. And don't forget to subscribe to the Road to Cinema podcast on Apple Podcast for the latest downloads every week. And you can also write us a nice review under the Road to Cinema podcast under the Apple Podcast page. And now we join screenwriter Ed Solomon as we take a look back on his career in comedy and then delve into Mosaic, which you can watch through the interactive app available on iOS and Android devices, as well as the six-part series, which airs on HBO every Monday night at 8 p.m. So I thought we could talk a little bit about your background before we jump into Mosaic. If I got this right, you're one of the youngest writers to ever sort of be on a television show. I think you were 19 when you were on Laverne and Shirley? Actually, I was 21. And ah. at the time, they said, hey, congratulations, you're the youngest guy in the Writers Guild. And I was m m too intimidated. I was basically too busy being intimidated by all the like really funny people around me <laughs> to pay any attention to anything other than the fact that, oh my God, I'm driving to a studio lot. And whoa, I'm on a stage. And it was really stressful, though, to be funny professionally around a table with like amazing comedy writers diving in as this young kid um so i started as a joke writer yeah. Yeah. and uh, i wrote i did some stand-up and i wrote jokes for comedians and it was gary shandling who was one of the first guys I, I wrote for who introduced me to this tv producer who came to see a play i wrote which was at ucla yeah. And he hired me on that show. Yeah, that's my beginning. And was, you went on to work on It's Gary Shandling's show. I did. I worked for the, on the first three years with of that show, which was really a um, fun. It was a really fun experience. And because hardly anyone watched it, we had almost no supervision. <laughs> and it was ridiculous. We had like, there's probably, I think we did about 20 shows a season. I worked on three seasons. And I, I'd say out of the 60 I worked on, there's probably 18 or 19 that I'm I think are really special, and then there's about yeah. 20 that are, you know, funny. It was a very meta show. It sort of deconstructed what a sitcom was, and it was very self-aware of all the tropes. And very much, and then I was gonna say, and there's about 20 that tanked, like didn't work on, uh, creatively to me, and the yeah. reason is, when the self-awareness got in the way of the story, the shows just deflated or imploded, meaning when you approach a story from purely a human or in story level, the gimmicks and the devices, the physics as we used to call it of the show, would follow naturally. But when we came up with a conceptual idea that started gimmick first, the shows themselves kind of suffered. They were, um, they just fell flat because it needed that truth, for lack of a better word, that needed the, you know, the story. And, and in fact, when we were working on Mosaic, I often used It's Gary Shandling Show as a kind of lesson, you really? know? Because Mosaic, we're doing a thing where we knew we were gonna do this branching narrative, we knew we were gonna have people choose a direction, a path to follow, and we never wanted to get in love with the tech of it. We never wanted to get in love with the gimmick of it. We wanted to lead with story and make every scene worthy of being in a TV show or a movie on its own and make the story, no matter which path you chose, to be as compelling and on first, you know, first attempt, we actually finished and looked at it and did a lot of revisions in post-production because we had learned so much as we were going on Mosaic. But funnily enough, 
Gary Shandling show was the thing I used <laughs> as my model of where did we screw up and where did we succeed, you know? Having that comedy background where you're constantly pitching jokes and, you know, you sort of always have to be on, do you think that helps in terms of creatively solving problems as a screenwriter where you can kind of look at things quickly and figure things out in a way? I don't think that the joke writing is the thing. I think that the, a good joke and a good dramatic moment come from exactly the same place. They come from a place of truth. And when it's funny, again, here we are with Gary Shanley again, but when you, when you broke a story with Gary, there was no difference than when I was breaking a story with Soderbergh, let's say, on Mosaic. Yeah. What's the truth of this moment? Why is this character here? What do they want? What are the internal rules telling us? You know, like if you're a musician, you know you're writing music, that's off key. You know, you know that. And so you know that with comedy as well. It wasn't the joke writing per se. What the joke writing does, especially if you are writing for comics, is it sharpens your sense of uh, what makes people laugh. It sharpens your ability to structure a joke. And if you, if you dive deep into a joke and pull it apart, a joke is, has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it actually has an overall structure, just like any story would have. So it kind of forces you in a condensed way. I mean, I guess that part helps. But to me, um, the problem a lot of comedy writers have is they go for the joke because it's their strength. It's what they know gives them a, a hit of uh, satisfaction. Yeah. So it actually can be a real pitfall if you're not careful. Well, also, too, did, was it helpful to be able to sort of know how to write the voice of someone in particular like a Gary Shandling? Like you could sort of plug, you could know exactly what he would say and how he would say it. That's a really interesting question. To me, if you're writing for a real human being or a character that exists only in your head and isn't personified by an actor, it's actually the same process, meaning... To really write a character that's three-dimensional and real, you have to live inside it. You have to not just be able to empathize with that character, but feel that character from that character's point of view, no matter who it is, your hero, your villain, any other character in between. When you're writing for an actor, you're doing a similar thing. You're assimilating their voice, you're internalizing them, and you're getting inside them. And then from that moment, from that position, you're actually creating a character that they're going to then do the same thing with. It's one degree of separation removed, but it's a very similar process. You hear and you feel that character. No matter if it's an actor or a fake character, you feel that personage. And I don't find it to be different once I hear the voice. For instance, I, um, I, 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 I I've been a meditator for a while, and I go to this retreat when I can, like at the end of the year, which is just a silent meditation retreat. And for some reason, in one of the <laughs> sits, I, I had this notion to write a parody of the meditation teacher <laughs> and just read it at the end. And I noticed in order to write it, I just had to kind of get inside his voice. He's not an actor. You know, he's a meditation teacher and getting or getting inside his head, I should say, and just getting inside his head and sort of feeling him from that position. It was really easy to write comedy about him. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably true, like with a teacher or a camp counselor or anyone that you're trying to parody. It's about just living inside their frame of mind. And then you write from there. And um, yeah. Well, to jump into Mosaic, I was curious what came first, sort of the, the, the story of the show, the concept of that? or the idea of making this for an app, and did you kind of work backwards toward making it a series, if that makes sense? We did a 10-minute prototype that was an entirely different story where we just experimented. Steven wrote a 10-page, 12-page script. We threw some ideas around for it. I kind of consulted a little bit on it, and then he shot it. Decided, hey, you know what? It would be interesting to explore a bigger story. What would be good stories that would work? in this medium and we decided to try to find a story that we could uh, that was bite sized you know it wasn't going to be so sprawling a canvas that we'd lose track given all the branches and stuff we thought a mystery would be a great way to start and i wanted to explore some themes of guilt and uh conscience and what would happen if you thought you might be you, you gradually discovered you might actually be guilty of for a crime that you don't remember having committed and he wanted to do a story that took place in a resort town that was like a true true crime true crime based sort of thing 
with a woman as the central character, kind of larger than life figure who gets murdered and maybe evidence surfaces a few years later. And so with that marching order in mind, like my desire and his desire, I went off for a week or two and texted him back and said, you know, I've also always wanted to do this story about uh, a, a person who maybe creates something that came fast, like came out of a dream, writes something, becomes famous. What if she's this character? What if she's this larger than life kind of narcissistic character who gets murdered? And since you're talking about a ski town, maybe there's snow and in the melt off, this thing emerges and the thing begins the, the, uh, opens up the crime again, the, the mystery and, uh, Maybe there's some thematic similarities between digging into yourself to find art and artistic expression and you're in a mining town and going under the ground and maybe there's some issues with what's under the ground as well as what's inside the person. And then it became working from that out. What about the themes of, um, uh, you know, the themes of what, what lies underneath, what's hidden underneath, and also for the notion of a sub very subjective tale, like we were doing, the ability to go into someone's frame of view, that seemed like it might be also really interesting. So the idea of the murder might have to do with something that's happening under her land, the idea of dreams, and gradually for Stephen, it became about what is the chain of events that occurs, the chain reaction of energy that explodes when someone's dream dies. And we worked from that out. We never thought, well, then we should do this because you can switch. We, <laughs> we, didn't, we, we never thought physics first. We went story first. Having now spent three years working on Mosaic, conception, production, post-production, having reconfigured it a few times in post-production just because we did a lot right. We made a lot of mistakes. We learned a ton as we did it. Having been through it for three years, I think in that form now. And we just finished a new, I finished a new script, which is for a new, new thing, entirely different story, different characters, 650 pages. A TV series? TV, whatever you would call it, I guess. I don't even know what you call it anymore, <laughs> you know? But finish that having actually had a better synthesis of, fun of function and form, I guess, where I wasn't thinking, well, if you split the screen here, what would the result be? It just felt more internalized. Um, in a way, I felt like my last three, actually four years was like, I went to grad school, I went to film school in this very specific form where that was my major. I had an incredible faculty. I had Steven Soderbergh and amazing actors and this incredible post-production process and a graduating class of one. That was me. <laughs> I feel like I learned so much and had such a great experience, yeah. How do you collaborate? I joined a fraternity, too, oh. of, of me, and it was fantastic. There was no sorority, though. We had very bad mixers. It was horrible, actually. How do you uh, collaborate with Steven? Because, I mean, is there sort of clear lines between director and screenwriter, or does it really all blend together in a way? Steven is uh, a joy. I, I, I can't even say it enough. I mean, as a writer, it's a dream because... First of all, he really respects you, not just the writer, but he really respects the writer, but not just that. Every head of every department, let's say, every actor he casts, every art director or designer, he trusts that you are there to do your job and you will do your job. He sees his role as director as there to help realize whatever the essential itness of the thing is and to highlight its strengths and to interpret it and that's where the art comes in to keep his own ego out of it it was an unbelievable experience in that way because i'm very used to directors who have less self-confidence and therefore are much more micromanagey he was the least micromanagey not just director but person i've ever worked with in the film business and yet he was the most in control fascinating complete freedom within parameters that he sets to do your job it makes you not just bring your a game but dig deeper and come out the other end of it better which was all i could ask for if mosaic i'm thrilled with the response mosaic's been getting i mean really happy but even if it had just fallen into the ocean and just blipped like a pebble i would have felt like these three years were 
like the best creative years I've had, you know, probably since I wrote, since Chris Mathis and I wrote Bill and Ted when it, actually it's funny, you mentioned Gary Shandling. Bill and Ted, Gary Shandling, and maybe Men in Black were all things that I felt like I was bushwhacking, like I didn't have rules for. Bill and Ted, we were just trying to make each other laugh and make ourselves laugh. We didn't know structure. We didn't know rules of screenwriting. We were just letting the divining rod was like what's interesting and fun to us. Shanling Show was just <laughs> like completely, um, uh, I mean, use the word retard, but I don't mean it as a mental retardation. I mean, actually, as in slowed, uh, as in people who have um, limited uh, <laughs> acumen in certain ways as writers. Like we were, we were writers with great strengths and great weaknesses, but not skilled at story, any of us, playing around in a sandbox trying to make each other laugh. With Men in Black, it was like, no, I, I don't think this is pure science fiction. No, it's not pure comedy. It's a hybrid, and I know you haven't seen that before. This is arguments I had with yeah. like Tommy Lee Jones all the time. Yeah, That's I always read he had problems with the humor of it. He doesn't, didn't quite latch on at first. I would say didn't quite latch on is, a, uh, is an understatement. Um, <laughs> it's either comedy or science fiction, make up your mind, asshole, I think is the quote. And I was like, dude, it's just not good enough science fiction to be dramatic. It needs the leaps of faith that comedy needs. I mean, to me, one of the many, many things that people never talk about when they talk about creation of movies, especially comedies, is mood. And... It's a pheromonal state that an audience is in and that you, the filmmaker, put the audience in with your deaf. If you're deaf and you're confident and you have control of your craft, you can right from the beginning create a mood. And that mood is the sandbox within which everyone plays, everyone, filmmaker and audience. And if you do it with the right amount of confidence, the audience relaxes and they are willing to make the leaps of faith that you want them to make. And with Men in Black, it was ridiculous. I mean, it was ridiculous. It's a ridiculous premise, but handled incredibly well by Barry Sonnenfeld, the cast perfect, Tommy Lee Jones, amazing performance because he played it straight. And I remember two weeks in, I can't remember whether it was the producer or Barry saying, Tommy just realized he's in a comedy. And what I thought made Tommy so great about it was he played it like a drama, you know, and which yeah. was perfect. He was just as serious it. in The Fugitive as he was in Men in Black in a way. We, he came off The Fugitive, which made him this gigantic star and great get. We got him for, he was the first person. Academy in, Award, I think, right? Academy yeah. Award, yeah. best sporting <laughs> actor. And in my mind, that was like the perfect casting and he was perfect. And he, he actually did a couple things that were giant lessons for me as a writer, for instance, um, and you, you heard me talk about this with Jay Moore, we, we talked about this a little bit, but yeah. there would be long paragraphs that I wrote that I thought were like great writing, I thought. I was wrong, but I thought at the time, like long sentences, eloquent speeches about the universe and your perspective or lack of perspective, and he would just take a pen and put a big X through it and say something like, yeah, well, I guess you thought you knew that, you know, and, and it said way more than everything I wrote. And what was interesting was Tommy would pare stuff down and make the writing better because of it. Will would add stuff and make the writing better because of it. It's fascinating, actually. Well, Tommy Lee Jones has that such command over screen acting in a way, you know, his face on camera is just so powerful. Yeah. He can do stuff so subtly. Yeah. Yeah, and they just different styles, you know, yeah. and talk about writing for people. Once, once they were in the movie, we could tailor the movie one way or another way. If an actor's in the moment, in the part, they're the best ad-libbers, you know, because they're, um, they're right there. They're right with it. Actors who ad-lib out of ego, who just want bigger lines, well, that's a nightmare for a writer. But actors who are in the moment and doing their work and come up with something, God, you, I couldn't love that more. I was curious for Mosaic, you have all these characters that you're working with. Did you create sort of separate uh, sort of storylines for them outside of the script that you sort of kept in your head as you were writing the actual script itself? We had a room. So you and I are sitting in a room that's what, like, how, how big is this room? A few hundred square feet, maybe, you yeah. know? 
um, at most. We had a room maybe five times the size, all whiteboards, and I did a very analog version of it. There was no digital way to keep the story collected, so I would sometimes handwrite scenes on the whiteboard or on pieces of paper and tack it onto the whiteboard, and we started to organize it that way around the room in terms of in the in the order of events, meaning. Olivia tells a story, she moves to this town, buys a property, she's famous, she meets this guy, she, or, you know, years go by, she meets this guy, they fall in love, he turns out to be a grifter, they, you know, I did it like that, and then with every character, Eric, the grifter's backstory, Joel's backstory, and put it all up on the wall, first handwritten, and then we transferred the handwriting to cards, magnetic, wow. dry erase if boards. this as a book, it would be interesting to see that. <laughs> you know... I think for a very select few, it might be. We actually, yeah. I recorded every single session Stephen and I had. I've got it, like, literally our back and forth from the very beginning to the end. And I, I have pictures because every iteration I take photos of the wall just so I have it in my records, you know, so in case it gets erased I, or I can always go back and look. But we then took those index, we, we transfer everything to index cards. Then we took the index cards and... Um, took them from one wall and walked them to the other wall and, and put them in a kind of narrative order. And uh, then we shot based on that. And I wrote based on that. I actually have a photo I'll show you, which doesn't, for a podcast, you can't really show people a photo, but I can show you. Oh, totally. And you can see the, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll drum it up and show it to you. Um, uh, and did you conceive sort of two layers from that, the app and then the actual, what the six episode series would be? We initially conceived of the app and then before we started shooting and what I'm showing you now what, what I'm what I'm showing Jeffrey is this board that has maybe 500 cards on it of scenes and it looks wow. they're all intersecting spider web of scenes and each different color of those is a different character and that's how we had that in the room between the editing room and my writing room when we were shooting and we would come into that room every night before we shot the next day and figure out okay what scene are we shooting and sometimes you would shoot, shoot a scene not just once, but three times. Yeah. You know, here's Joel's point of view, here's Nate's point of view, here's Petra's point of view, and they were very different. So um, It's almost like you could get lost within that map in a way. Which is, uh, that was part of our challenge, was how do, we both des how do I design a story that I'm not going to get lost in, and how do we shoot it in a way that we're not going to get lost in? And we realized before we started shooting that we're also doing a linear version, so that put double onus on us to make sure that the, the characters were deeply rounded and nuanced and could be told from many different directions. A lot of times when you're writing a movie, let's say, or even a TV show, but even more so with, with the screenplay, you're thinking of your story in terms of your central character and servicing the plot. And a lot of your characters are really only reflections of that central character's needs or their obstacles or whatever, however you want to conceptualize it and they're not really that well-rounded this forced me to think three-dimensionally about every character which allowed us to not just re-edit a store the story in the app branching narrative version but also helped us in constructing the linear version of it so that it worked and it actually works I think kind of well it's actually interesting it's it's an entirely different telling of the same story which as a story geek myself is revelatory like oh my god here is the same here are the same events same footage reconfigured so the one thing was having a, a good solid understanding of what actually happened that helped us the other is having an amazing brilliant facile dexterous editor who was also the director <laughs> Stephen, who could any camera operates and any camera DP. operates any dps <laughs> and he, he does some catering and uh, no he doesn't do the catering um uh, probably thankfully um yeah it was uh that that really helped us but you know to, to do it as a, a linear but what was amazing to me especially now that i had an opportunity to watch some of the linear version of it the broadcast version with an audience which helps you see it through other people's eyes you realize the difference that purely subjective storytelling like the app is to what i would call more objective storytelling what do i mean by that subjectively 
in the narrative, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the branching narrative version, you make a choice and you pick a point of view and you follow that point of view. You don't have full context. The tension doesn't mount really until you're deeper into the story. It's a different kind of tension, I should say. But in the branching, and in the branching narrative version, it actually requires you to kind of spend more time with it before you get the full context of it. Because you realize if you go one way, you see one thing. But if you go another way, you see an entirely different take on the story. But with the linear version, the tension's there right up front. And that's because the viewer has more information than the character. And because the viewer knows things that the character doesn't know, it creates a different kind of um, uh, energy, tension. It creates a tension that's not there in the linear. But the linear has a different... I mean, I'm sorry, forgive me, this is not there in the branching. Yeah. But the branching has different pleasures. And Which would you recommend watching first? I, I watched the entire app first, and I jumped into the first episode, and it really like threw my brain. I'm like, wow, like, like now I know what that means, and that means, and it kind of shifts for you. But what would you sort of recommend for people to do? I'm, I would say I'm kind of agnostic in that all my experience is like yours because the app was out first, so I too, and we worked on the app for a year, and then we did the linear. So all my experience with it is app first, then linear. Yeah. But if you're a person who can't decide whether to do the app or the linear first, I'd say go to the linear because the app is all about making choices. And if you get anxious about <laughs> the first choice, you'll probably, you might be anxious about the others. And also I'd say, hey, why don't you watch the linear first? Because I'm, I've heard a lot of feedback from people that have watched the app first. So I'm curious myself <laughs> what you think if you go linear first. The app has more um, little avenues, to cul-de-sacs, I guess, to go in and little deeper dives you can take here and there. They're different. One is more definitive than the other. And it's not because we were trying to be clever or appoint you. You've seen one, now go see the other. It's not that at all. It was more... Each had its own organic rules. This one feels like it needs to be more definitive. This one feels like it needs to be more ambiguous. It's not, and I guess theoretically, there is a definitive answer, I guess. But I would like to believe in my fantasy world that within the, within the universe of the one that's less definitive, that that's actually the only answer. The only answer is it's not, it's not there. We don't know the answer, it's ambiguous. But, don't know if that will work because we exist in a world where both exist and people can go back and forth. I would say don't go back and forth because they're structured so differently. Yeah. Like if you start one, finish it, and then go to the other. Yeah, because you, I was almost tempted to sort of go into the app and like go to the places that I didn't choose. And I'm like, well, I think I'll wait on that maybe right. down the line. It's interesting to see. And it was, it's a masterful work of editing, I thought, on Stephen's part to be able to uh, restructure it in a way. And... Um, the last two episodes, I think, are particularly interesting because they're like a diptych. And I'm guessing that there are going to be people who start episode six. Episode six starts exactly the same as episode five. And there are going to be people calling the HBO switchboard <laughs> going, I think you guys screwed up. You're, you know, you know just wait. Give it two minutes. <laughs> Give it two and a half minutes. And you'll, you'll yeah. So are you going to dive back in and do something similar to this next? Uh, something interactive? I just spent all year doing that um and i'm going to do another one i spent uh, all year working on this 10 hours of material that i wrote on spec that we were talking about before is like, that with steven soderbergh it's with steven he's not directing he's producing uh, and with casey silver who produced uh, the first you know who produced mosaic and i have some more i'd like to do so i'm and i love i love working in this new genre i guess form whatever you would call it i don't know what to call it though like, I don't know what it is. It's not, I don't know what to say. Well, my friends are like, dude, stop being like obnoxious. What are you working on? I'm like, I seriously don't know. I seriously don't know what this is. What is it? Is it a TV or a movie? I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. I just don't know what to call it. Okay. Just fine. But yeah. <laughs> but it's great having both because you kind of reference one another. And then after like watching one, you can see the things that you may have not have seen in the previous one. So 
you know, if you're that into it, if someone, I don't mean you, Jeffrey, but like yeah. if someone is that into it, they, that's awesome. That's amazing. Thank you. I'm so grateful for that. But they also exist separately and you don't have to watch them both. You can watch one, you can watch the other, or you can watch both. I don't, you'll have a complete experience. There'll be a different experience in, e in either of them. I would say if you go through the app, a lot of people go through the app, finish one line and think, oh, I know the answer. And then they talk to their friend and go, and their friend goes, I, I know the answer, and they're different answers. So I say if you're going to do the app, give it a shot, like give, get into the depth of it um, before you feel like you've solved it, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So after going through the app, I may not have known the exact answer that I think I know. <laughs> Did you go through once to the end? Just and, once, yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, Did you follow at the end Petra, Joel, Nate? Do you remember which side you were uh, on? More in Petra, and then at the end, I think it was the uh, the housekeeper. Got it. Right at the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm not gonna say anything just okay. to not spoil. It. <laughs> um, they're they're different. It's very different. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, dude, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks again for listening to the Road to Cinema podcast. We'll see you next time.